I didn't work out because you know, I thought it was so cliche. You know, dudes come to prison, they work out. You know, you get big and strong and all that stuff. And then just after a while, I just, I had too much idle time and I kept getting in trouble. A buddy of mine started talking to me about lifting. I just got into it and now it's more of a take out my frustrations down here. That's more of it than anything. It's a stress reliever. <laughs> Don't burn, man. <laughs> We work everything all week long. You hit every body part at least once. Like on Monday, you would have a bench day, and uh, Tuesday, you might do shoulders, lats, and traps. Wednesday, you do arms, and Thursday, you might have another heavy bench day. You got a leg day in there somewhere. In a survival of the fittest environment, the weight yard is one of the few places where inmates can find encouragement. Come on, want another one? Let's get another one, D. Push it, push it, push it, push it, push it, push it. That right there is 315 pounds. Okay, that's a lot of weight. Yeah, I only weigh 170. So that's, double, that's about double my weight. A lot of these guys, they motivate you to lift that kind of weight. You know, they tell me, get off, get off the ball, get off the ball, New York, come over here. Come mess with the big dogs. Get that money, man. Yeah, man. Get that money. We've met other inmates whose disciplinary problems keep them off the yard. But even confined to their cells, they're still determined to work out. The inmates that, uh, that succeed generally are the ones that don't let their bodies completely uh, deteriorate on them. I just focus on the street and where I'm going to be at again one day. That's how I get by every day. They are constantly coming up with uh, interesting ways to, uh, to exercise. Most of it is, is calisthenics. One, two, three, four. A lot of the inmates will uh, fill bags full of water for weightlifting. And that kind of creativity is important because some prisons have permanently removed weights from the yard. So that's why we're out here trying to improvise and stuff. You know, lifting garbage cans and things like that. We took a good, you know, a wholesome thing from us. You know, it's like, you know, something that was filling people's time and taking away negative energy. Took those out. Some prison authorities see all this added muscle as a potential security threat but others see benefits to having weights on the yard. I think the important thing for, for inmates is to keep them occupied, you know, and that's what we try to do here at the institution. John Alt was warden at Anamosa State Penitentiary at the time we shot there. Any time you can have inmates participate in some type of meaningful activity, it makes their time easier, it makes staff's time a lot easier. I'd much rather have them participate in something that's positive than sitting around with nothing to do and talking about maybe how to pull a better arm robbery or plotting against us or fellow staff members. During our shoot at Indiana State Prison, authorities even allowed for a weightlifting competition. Lions, 495. Lions now lifting at 495. Penitentiaries get your weight up. This how they, this how they doing it. Get your weight up. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. On deck. We push. On deck. Good lift. Good lift. You got it. Of course, in prison. There's also a practical side to staying in shape. If you ever come against somebody who wants to approach you in a, in a negative way, attack you in a fight or something, you don't want to be the person that's going to run out of air first. The person that runs out of air first is the person that gets hurt. In a combat zone, you have to be combat ready. And we all know that any minute this yard in two seconds can explode into violence. Bill Hankins, a long-term inmate at Colorado State Penitentiary, knows about sudden explosions. During a routine strip search, Hankins snapped. I used to get real frustrated behind these doors. I used to bet it drive me to where I'd be worked up, just ooh, wanted to, you know, get at him. Hankins is serving life without parole for killing a grocery store clerk during a robbery. In this supermax facility, 
He has not allowed contact with other inmates, but he is released from his cell for an hour of daily solitary exercise. It's what keeps him going. Being locked down all day long, every day for 23 hours a day and coming out in a little room to work out, you know, it was difficult first couple of years. But then I realized, you know, I'm just giving myself high blood pressure. While lockup crews have shot dozens of workout routines, the strangest has to have been at the Miami-Dade County Jail by two inmates who covered their faces to remain anonymous. You feel me? With the arm right here and the chest. I'm in training, you know? I got him this big. After a round of what they called bed lifts, they showed us how they do chin-ups in the showers. But correctional staff took a dim view of their workout routine. Yeah, my man, you gotta get off that bar. That's it? That's it for that. And no, no more of that workout stuff. Next, a lockup bra, the daily grind. I got a six-year-old daughter, and how am I going to explain to her that when daddy gets upset, he cuts and burns himself? When prison life gets to these inmates, they turn their weapons on themselves. I did that scar about 10 years ago. I cut it from the ankle all the way up to the hip bone, all the way down to the bone. While some inmates make use of their time in prison to build up their bodies, others tear them down. Brian Murray is one such inmate. I'm in here for causing trouble, cut myself and stuff like that. Show me where you cut yourself. I'm gonna stick my arm out. We met Murray at Iowa State Penitentiary, serving 10 years for stealing cars. He had spent the last two years in cell house 220, also known as the hole. This is your maximum security unit inside of a maximum security prison. Here's where we house all additional detention inmates that couldn't be handled at another institution or couldn't be handled in our general population area. Now we have to deal with them over here. During his time in prison, and especially in the hole, Murray has found a coping device in self-mutilation. I've been in here so long, it kind of releases stress and... How do you cut yourself? I was on razors, but they gave, put me on razor restrictions, and then I find stuff in here, like staples and plastic from deodorants and stuff like that. When was the last time you cut yourself? About two weeks ago. The next day on their way to another interview in cell house 220, our crew ran into Murray as correctional officers were moving him into a holding area so that they could inspect his cell. Can you tell us what's going on, Captain? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what's going on? I'm just taking him out to shake down his cell. Why? Because he's been cutting on his arm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Brian, what's going on with you? Oh, man, you just... I'm just stressed out. What? Just stressed out. And what have you done? Yeah, I didn't really know. Myself. He does it for attention, and we come down, and we try to talk to him and, and get him to behave, and generally he does for a while. Kind of afraid I get forgot about, you know? Is it because you're locked up all the time? Talk to me about that. Yeah, being in a cell 24 hours a day for the last six, seven years kind of gets to person. Officers search Murray's cell for his cutting tool. Shaking the cell down to find any other plastic. He has a piece of plastic stuck in his arm. So... And quickly locate the weapon. He taken his cap off his toothpaste and had uh, broken it off to make a sharp edge and had started cutting his arm with it. Reopened his scars from where he previously cut himself up. So now what? Now I can just go back to my cell and wait another couple. Lockup crews have encountered many other self mutilators. Some people self injure as a manipulation because they want to get moved. 
Some people self-injure as a cry for help. Some people self-injure to get even. You know, I'm going to hurt myself and I'm going to show you kind of thing. So anger. Our crew got a rare glimpse at just how prevalent self-mutilation is at the Wabash Valley Correctional Facility in Indiana. I need to go on 11. 11 range. 11 range. Yeah. Thank you. Prison psychologist Mary Ruth Sims conducts group therapy with cutters and other self-mutilators assigned to Wabash's secured housing unit. Once I see my blood, I'm in another world. I'm a different, I'm somebody totally different from myself. That's the only time I actually, you know, can actually feel real, feel alive, and feel like everything's gonna be okay. Sim says this particular group does not injure themselves for the typical reasons. They self-injured as a way to control their level of pain. That when they're in so much pain that they don't know what to do, that they're starting to feel like suicide, that self-injury cuts their level of pain down. So it's pain control. It's like a baby crying wanting this bottle. You give, you give the baby this bottle because it's crying or it changes diaper. Me, you give me something sharp to hurt myself with and, 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 and then, I, then I'm fine. You're communicating that things aren't okay to yourself. If, if I don't cut myself at least once a week, I, I'm not right. Some people here think that there's nothing good in them at all, that they've messed up totally and, you know, they're just totally worthless. I mean, I know the problems I have need to be fixed. I got a six-year-old daughter, and how am I going to explain to her that when I get, when daddy gets upset, he cuts and burns himself? Inmates deemed not to be a threat to others are assigned to Wabash's residential treatment unit where they're granted more time outside of their cell. That's where we met Joe Carr, who had a long history of self-mutilation. I was antisocial. I didn't want to be around nobody. I didn't want nobody around me. I wanted to be by myself. Everything made me angry, you know? And I would take a lot of it out on myself, then I would feel better. I would take a razor blade and cut myself up real bad, you know, and, and then it'd all be all right, you know? I did that scar about about 10 years ago, I cut it from the ankle all the way up to the hip bone, all the way down to the bone. Then I, crawl, I cut it across sideways, so the surgeons have to take about 12 hours to sew me up. You got seven layers of skin you got to go through before you get to the bone. You know, and you, and you it, when you're going through one of them phases, you don't even feel the pain. You don't even know you're doing it. This happens. Carr, who has spent 25 years in and out of prison for robberies to support a drug habit, used his tattoos to disguise his many scars. With this whole arm, if you bend it, you can see it was cut from here all the way down and around all the main arteries. I just had it tattooed up to try to hide the, hide the scar so it wouldn't look as bad. When we met him, Carr was still recovering from his latest self-injury. He had swallowed several pens. And he was still trying to heal up on my belly here where they took me to surgery and they cut me open. They had to go in there and take them ink pens out. Then they left one in, so they had to retake me to surgery for the second time to get the other stuff out. And that's why it's taken so long to heal up. At the time of our shoot, Carr had only two years left on his sentence and had mixed feelings about his chances of survival on the outside. Myself over and over, are you ready for it? Can you handle it? Because this is all I know right now. This is this here is my world right now. This is where I, this is what raised me. The OC raised me. You know, that's a, something I don't know right now. I've been pulling time in Nashville. Coming up on Lock Up Raw. Writing music in prison is just my life how one inmate copes with the stark conditions of prison life. And later... The mentality of most inmates in this unit is, I'm on death row, there's nothing you can do to me. Violence and hopelessness on death row. <laughs> At almost every prison profiled on lockup, our crew meets a certain number of repeat offenders who in some ways are more at home inside prison than out. At San Quentin, we met one young inmate who compared it to a once popular TV show. 
Yeah. See, because it's like that movie, that, that little show, Cheers, where everybody you know your name. And mm -hmm. You come back and it's more, oh, what's up, homie? What's up? Then you see all your friends, you know what I mean? You feel like, oh, well, I'm cool here. These are my boys, you know what I'm saying? Here, they know they, this is home. But most inmates hold a much different opinion. Prisons are height factories. They can't produce anything but height. All you have is hate, loneliness, greed, and just misery. When we met Gerald McCullough at the Riverbend Maximum Security Institution near Nashville, Tennessee, he was halfway through a 12-year sentence on a sexual offense charge. There's no way out. There's just nothing to do. This is just a total waste of someone's life. Despite his pessimism, McCullough had found a productive outlet to express his pain. They say it's raining in Denver. That it's really kind of cold. But I'm just pulling time in Nashville. How am I supposed to know? Shooting in a prison in, in Nashville, the, uh, the home of country music, uh, we decided it'd be great if we could find a, uh, a country singer. And uh, so we kind of made the call out to the other inmates and uh, correctional officers, and, and they, they came up with McCullough, and he turned out to be pretty good. music in prison is just my life. I don't sit down to write a song. Something hits me and my best songs come with about two minutes. And about two or three minutes I have an excellent song. And um, I wrote Pulling Time in Nashville at the Walls, which is Tennessee State Prison, which is shut down now. Tell the family to come and see me. I let my feelings out in my songs, and I write old-time country. I don't write anything but old-time country. When I'm under pressure and depressed, I write all the time. All I do is write my songs and play my guitar and study the Bible and uh, try to stay out of trouble. Though confined to prison, McCullough confided he still had dreams. With a fool. I just want to uh, go into a studio and cut a couple albums and uh, try to make it. What I plan to do is get out and go to church and find happiness. And happiness is valuable because there's not really a whole lot of happy people that I know. We may smile and laugh and joke, but we're not happy. It's hard to be happy in a place like this. executed by firing squad. Fear, despair, and violence. Lock up crews travel to death row. As I'm applying the handcuffs, he grabbed my arm and pulled it in real quick, and he ran a razor blade down my arm. It commands a breathtaking view of the San Francisco Bay. But it's the end of the road for some of the most dangerous inmates in the country.
country. More than 600 condemned men await their execution dates here on death row at California's San Quentin State Prison. In many of the prisons lockup crews have visited, death row is a quiet place where inmates are much more concerned with filing appeals than causing trouble. That's not the case here. Me, myself, I consider everybody in here, every inmate in here a potential threat. Our producer met two officers assigned to keep watch in the adjustment center, where San Quentin's most violent death row inmates are housed. The daily grind here is bleak for both inmates and staff. The mentality of most inmates in this unit is, I'm on death row, there's nothing you can do to me. If I assault you today, there's nothing they'll do to me tomorrow. You can only kill me once. Assaults are so common here that any contact with inmates, even serving meals, requires officers to suit up in full riot gear. But that doesn't stop them from gassing, which is where they throw a variety of substances. It can be anything, urine, feces. Anytime that you pop open the food court, you're vulnerable. That inmate has, there's an opening for that inmate to assault you. Death Row at San Quentin is a really scary place, and, and the adjustment center is the scariest place of death row. They allowed us to shoot uh, a feeding. The guy had to get there you know, before dawn and suit up, and even with all the protective gear I had to wear to shoot, I, they wouldn't let me go beyond a certain point to shoot it. And the footage camera operator Mike Elwell showed captures the extreme precautions staff must follow. It takes a team of three officers to serve this breakfast of pancakes and grits. Uh, and maybe might try and grab your arm, pull it into the cell so he can break it or stab it or, you know, cut it, slash it. Yeah, it reminded me of, you know, feeding, uh, you know, vicious animals. It was, uh, it was a particularly creepy experience. We found a much quieter and calmer atmosphere when we shot on death row inside the Riverbend Maximum Security Institution in Tennessee. But correctional staff warned our producer, appearances can be deceiving. As you see here, it's real quiet. What that leads to is complacency. That is the worst enemy of a staff person working on death row. While most of the inmates here play by the rules, our crew is told there was one especially dangerous exception. He has uh, cut two of our officers here, sliced the throat of another inmate, set fire to his cell. Very dangerous inmate, the most dangerous inmate we have here right now. And we have to treat him with extra caution because he will hurt you or kill you any opportunity he gets. That inmate, convicted killer Henry Hodges, requires a team of five correctional officers to escort him whenever he leaves his cell. That particular death row inmate was a harsh reality check for me. Officer Robert Mosley was one of Hodge's victims. Got medical on the unit. I took the pipe flap down, went to do, apply his handcuffs, and I got distracted. As I'm applying the handcuffs, he grabbed my arm and pulled it in real quick, and he ran a razor blade down my arm. It blew me away. I didn't know what had actually happened until I pulled my arm out and saw the severity of the injury. Mosley's sliced arm required 59 stitches and the scar isn't only physical. The psychological effect never goes away. I think you learn to adjust to it. You can't take this job for granted. These guys are not here, but for the right reasons, and the reality of, of, the, uh, of it every day is there. Keep your eyes on the inmates at all times. Don't ever take your eye off them, especially on death row, because these guys got nothing to lose if they were to injure you. Hodges declined to talk to our producers on camera. Ironically, the prison videotapes his every move. We film him everywhere he goes when he comes out of that cell, just like you're filming me, so that we can maintain some kind of discipline. It's secure. But when we traveled to Utah State Prison, we met one condemned man who was willing to speak with us. At the time of our interview, Ralph Menzies had been on death row for 17 years. I remember when Ralph Menzies was first brought to the interview room uh, so that we could talk to him. You know, they're setting up the lights and getting the microphone set, making sure the lighting is just so. And it's important to establish a rapport very quickly. And Ralph and I start to have a little bit of small talk. To us two years ago. 
years ago. But. And I'll never forget, I asked him, hey, what are you watching on TV these days? And he told me that he was a big fan of the OC. I see OC all the time. Yeah? I like that. What, uh, what's your favorite? I gotta be honest with you, I love you. Listening to, what's, uh, what are your favorite characters on that? Oh, uh, my favorite character is Kelly Rowan. Yeah? She's, she's pretty hot. Menzies' interest in women became more disturbing when we learned the details of his crime. Ralph's crime um, allegedly was, was a brutal one. He kidnapped a female from a convenience store and took her up one of the canyons, uh, tied her to a tree, and then cut her throat, and then left her there. Well, I've always maintained my innocence. I've done a lot of things in my life, you know, and uh, that I'm not proud of, but this particular one is not one of them. I just come to the conclusion that karma bit me in the ass. I personally wish they would either overturn my case, my conviction, or execute me and get it over with. Whereas now, you don't know if it's going to be five years down the road, if it's going to be two years or 10 years, what they're going to decide. And that's really hard. In Utah, if you were convicted before a certain date, you were actually given a choice between lethal injection and the firing squad. And when I asked Ralph the very sobering question of what method have you chosen for the execution, he, in no uncertain terms, said, uh, I chose to be executed by firing squad because the only other option here is lethal injection. That's what they do to dogs when they don't want them. I'd rather uh, sit up and take it and have them look at me. If they're going to shoot me, look at who they're killing. Next on Lock Up Raw, The Daily Grind. It began as a simple interview, but turned into one of the most bizarre incidents captured by our cameras. And later... I don't know, I guess I perceive myself to be a, a sitcom or something, you know? Wherever I go, there's music in the background, the lighting's just perfect. Arguably, the happiest prisoner we ever met. On the first day of production at California's Kern Valley State Prison, our producers set out to shoot a simple story about one of the ways inmates in administrative segregation deal with the monotony of being locked in their cells 23 hours a day. They pass reading materials and other items to each other through a technique called fishing. All right. All right. Go ahead. Take off. Right. Though fishing is against prison rules, Inmate Tracy Washington was willing to demonstrate how to make a fishing line. This is just a string made out of the waistband of our under by our boxers. We take the string apart and then we put a little soap in a piece of plastic and it gets a weight and then we slide it across the floor like this. The officer might come in here and take my line now that he know I got it, but I have to make another. Go ahead and shoot it out. But our producer was about to find out that there was a far more dramatic story surrounding inmate Washington. I went to the crisis bed on suicide watch last week, and I just came back last week. Why? What happened? Well, he was trying to send me somewhere I didn't want to be. So what you do? Cut my wrist with a razor blade. Washington went on to explain that he cut his wrist to prevent the prison from transferring him to the Sensitive Needs Yard, or SNY. It's a place most inmates want nothing to do with. Sensitive Needs Yard is basically for prisoners that meet certain criteria, such as uh, most of your rapists, your molesters, your dropout gang members. It used to be referred to as PC Yard, uh, Protective Housing Unit. Marcus Waite, Washington's neighbor and fishing partner, told us how a move to SNY makes an inmate damaged goods. And the SNY uh, isn't just so much uh, rapists and child molesters, it's weaker guys, especially guys that are doing life sentences and stuff like Mr. Washington. You know, anytime he's seen by his peers, which are the guys on the main line, they're gonna consider him a piece of S, you know? I'll say a piece of 
Hey, Washington, I'm giving you a direct order to go to Sea Yard. I'm not going to no S&Y Yard. I'm not going. I'm not S&Y, so... Serving 25 years to life for crimes he's including battery on a police officer, assault 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 on a police
When our producer checked in on Washington a few days later, she found him working out in his cell. Since I last saw you, you were refusing SNY. So well, tell me what's going on. They, they got me in a hole. They charged me with a 115 for inciting. Probably they transported me out to another pen. I'm a reputable individual. I've been walking these main lines for 20 years, and I'm not no coward. Coming up on Lock Up Bra, The Daily Grind. The last time I was here, me and the boyfriend lived in the same cell. We had the matching comforters and the matching jackets. We were a little couple. His name's Polando, and he can't figure out why all the other inmates are complaining. This is where I make me, the beautiful me. At the Spring Creek Correctional Center in Alaska, we encountered a number of inmates who assured us that despite the natural beauty surrounding the prison, they felt it was hell on earth. Okay, I'm currently in the worst cell that you can be in. You got a concrete slab for a bunk. You got a where you sleep. You got a where you think. It's no good, it's all bad. Then we met an inmate with a very different approach to prison life. I don't know. I guess I perceive myself to be a sitcom or something. You know, wherever I go, there's music in the background. The lighting's just perfect. And I'm always funny with just the right line. And there's a like, studio audience somewhere. And all eyes are on me. Orlando Playhouse. <laughs> That's just me, the queen. Despite being back at Spring Creek for a second stint, this time for burglary, Orlando Williams was determined to show us that not only was he gay, he was happy. I talk about being um, homosexual in prison. Because, you know, I think people have this conception that, oh, it's dangerous, yeah. scary. Ooh, you mean like if you watch Oz? That's right. <laughs> it's not, please. First of all, people don't rape homosexuals. <laughs> you know, when people hear the thing about getting raped in prison or whatever, they rape guys who aren't homosexual. Those are the guys that get raped. Who rapes a homosexual? You know what I'm saying? Oh, please. Most of them, if you scream at them real hard, you can marry them. According to Polando, finding a place to fit in led to his first criminal conviction. And we warned him, Polando likes to talk. I'm feminine. I always wanted to be feminine. I always wanted to be a woman or whatever. So I, I, I seen these women on TV and, and, and in my life that I wanted to emulate and be like. Then I found out that I could dress up like a girl. This is where I make me, the beautiful me. The people that I would meet, because I was going to the, to the, you know, I was prostituting myself, um, the guys that I would meet don't know me. So they don't know that the character I'm being isn't really me. You, you know, prostitution became, it, it was fun. I, get to, I got to play at, I got to, you know, I mean, had some drama and bad times, but hey, it was fun. Then I started going to jail, first for the little prostitutions and then for uh, being under the influence of, of heroin. I was a heroin addict in the beginning. I obsess over the drug, so I don't just get high. I get high and high and high and high and continue to get high. In the world according to Polando, incarceration meant liberation. I get to be me in jail, and I'm meeting these guys, and of course, you know, there's all kind of little undercurrent homosexual whatever's going on in jail. Some guys are under the impression that it don't count when you're in jail, or as long as they pitch and don't catch, or whatever they, whatever's going through their head. It doesn't matter. I got to be Susie Homemaker in jail. Woo! Woo! Williams freely admits he doesn't find prison life to be a terrible grind. This is my uniform for work. I'm a referee for the uh, for the rec department here in Seward. The last time I was here, me and the boyfriend lived in the same cell. We had the matching comforters and the matching jackets and whatever. You know, we had packages come in, and we'd always have a little matching set or whatever, and we were a little couple. You know what I'm saying? This is Williams returned to Spring Creek to find his boyfriend had been transferred to another prison. But this time, he's in no hurry to find a new relationship. But don't let there be any misunderstandings. So you stay celibate in prison? I did not say that. 
I didn't say that. Say what? I didn't say that I was celibate. I just said I'm not a slut. <laughs> of course I'm not celibate. Oh my god. Uh, not, I don't want to get into my partners, but uh, I, you know, I'm not gonna go without. <laughs> Please. Hi. I won't act like I'm surprised because you've already seen me once today. But <laughs> how are you doing? At the time we met him. Polando had less than a year to serve and was receiving so, uh, counseling to prepare him okay. for a career on the outside. And then, of course, the bartending. Uh, <laughs> I know you don't think that's good I don't good think for... that would be good I, for you. But I'm telling you, I can't think of any other place where I get to be, do all the talking <laughs> and be the center of attention at all times. I still think you'd make a good hairdresser. You know I, why? I, probably, I don't think I'd make a good hairdresser. Because I'm too... Uh, Despite his generally upbeat outlook, Williams had a surprisingly bleak prediction of life ahead. I'm going to stay here until it's time for me to go home. The door's going to open. They're going to say goodbye. And of course, I'm going to leave out of here with maybe enough money to live off of for a week. So I'm not going to be able to support myself, which eventually will lead me back to selling dope, which will give me enough money to support myself. It puts me back into the place where I'm, if I'm selling dope, eventually I'm going to indulge in the dope that I sell. And now I'm getting high again. And one thing leads to another. And I'm back into the life that I was before I came, before I, yeah.